Can we start? Okay. So, good evening and good afternoon and welcome to the Collegio Carlo Alberto. We are, I'm very pleased today because I see a full class, a full room. Last time we had uh, the full, full, a full class, especially full of students, was for Madame Lagarde. So now here we are, we have the student people here and also people online. So we are doing even better. And it's really nice to see a room full of people these days and particularly full of students. I'm really grateful that you are all here. I'm really, really pleased. Uh, we welcome today Massimo Rostagno and I'm really pleased because he is the Director General for Monetary Policy at the European Central Bank that, as you, as you can understand nowadays, is not a very crucial role in policy making, <laughs> not, not very crucial. Uh, we are living in a period which is really hard and I think it's really a very difficult time for central bankers, particularly so, because on the, <laughs> ones, on the one hand we, have, we are observing a rising inflation, very rapidly rising inflation. Uh, on the other hand, because of the war, and because of the slow exit from COVID, we're also facing a, let's say, not the growth rate we were expecting in the economy. Uh, we were expecting a rapid, very <coughs> dynamic exit from COVID, from the COVID period. And instead, we are observing a slowing down, especially because of the war. And because of COVID and because of the war, one of the reasons for rising prices is also the fact that there are problems and constraints in the global value chains. So there are supply constraints that are affecting considerably the dynamic of prices that are probably more difficult to deal with by central bankers. So on the one hand, they have to tame inflation, and it's in part a supply-driven inflation, which is hard to tame. And on the other hand, they have to make sure that essentially the economy doesn't slow down too fast. So I think it's really, this is a crucial moment for having you and for having this discussion. Actually, uh, Massimo is going to present a book, which is in fact, which is Monetary Policy in Times of Crisis. And actually, one couldn't say that there isn't not a better time than this one as a time for crisis. But uh, on the other hand, I think that the book is backward looking. So it's telling us what is the history of European monetary policy in several times of crisis. And what is fascinating is that when we start looking at the initial design of uh, monetary policy within the ECB, we see that actually the real problem was inflation as it is today. And so it was to keep prices down. And then we moved to a period of deflation. And for many of us who are old enough, uh, deflation was not an issue. Deflation was never on the agenda. And suddenly, it <laughs> came in the agenda after the debt crisis. And I see students, for younger people, probably inflation has never been on the agenda for them. Uh, they, grow, they, have, they grew up, they have grown up in a period of deflation instead. And of course, moving from a period of inflation to a period of deflation to a new period of inflation implies adjusting a lot in the policy agenda for monetary, policy, for, for monetary authorities. It's very different if you are living through a period of inflation. If your problem is inflation, or if your problem is deflation. So there is, uh, even though now the ECB has moved to a more symmetric policy target, okay, there is certainly an issue of asymmetry in policy making, depending on which state of the world you are dealing with. So Massimo, uh, really, really looking forward to your presentation, which is really going to be fascinating. I have to, to, to thank uh, Giovanna Nicodano, who has organized this event, and that has brought also a lot of students with us. Uh, I have to thank Guido Scari, who will be the other discussant of the presentation by Massimo, and naturally, Marco Zatterin, uh, the vice editor of La Stampa, who will chair this session with his usual skill and insightfulness. So I think I leave the floor to you. And thank you very much to everybody. And thank you also, f as, as always, to the team of Collegio Carlo Alberto that organizes everything very skillfully and very well. And thank you to Cinzia and all your team for this, and Alberto for the technical side. 
Thank you very much, and looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Matthew. I don't know. Uh, uh, just a few, uh, just a few words. Thank you very much, President. Yes, my name is Marco Zatterin. I'm the deputy editor in chief of your daily newspaper, La Stampa. Uh, I had written a few notes, but uh, um, uh, your president said it all. Uh, I would just like to add one short remark. I have a friend who met the Pope 15 days ago, and at the end of the meeting, the Pope looked at him and said, pray for me, this is a difficult job. And, uh, and, and today, and I've been thinking about this, this quote from uh, uh, Francesco, for the past two weeks, and I think that it, it's, a good, it's a good quote for Mrs. Lagarde, too, and for the central banks. We should, we should all pray for them, because they have a very difficult task. So uh, I'll cut the crap and, 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 <laughs> and give the floor straight to Massimo Rostagno, and it's indeed a pleasure and an honor to have him here today, um, because he, he comes from the heart of the central bank. He's been writing these books, this book has been telling the story of the past years, or how we, 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 we came out of a very difficult crisis. Now he's going to tell the story of this book, and then I hope uh, he's going to uh, share with us some ideas and some views about the world we're living in and the possible uh, outcomes of this very difficult time, because after the pandemic, now we have a war. And so maybe we are the closest to our darkest hour since 1945. Massimo Rostagno, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, extremely grateful for, for this event, you know, and uh, particularly to Giovanna, but to Collegio Carlo Alberto uh, as, a, as a whole for organizing this event. And it's, uh, it's great to be here, not through a flat screen, uh, seeing you all in, uh, in 3D. Um, so let me say straight from uh, from the beginning. Oh, oh I see. So um, so it's, it's done from from you. Okay. Does uh, yeah maybe. Yeah. Anyway. Um, okay. And by the way, um, many thanks also on behalf of all uh, my my quarters, whose name you you see now on the slide. Um, let me say one thing uh, straight of the beginning. It's a confession. I, I, I feel slightly embarrassed about the title of this book, particularly the times of crisis part uh, of the title, because this book covers uh, 20 years of history of, of, of the ECB uh, between 99 when the ECB you know, started and uh, 2018. So the, the cutoff date is the end of uh, 2018 where all charts end and the, the narrative no stops. Uh, but the problem with that is that, of course, uh, the crisis started uh, later. So it uh, started in, uh, uh, in 2019, 2020. So that, that, that those are the years where we saw really what the crisis is. You know? And uh, the, our thoughts go to the, to the pandemic first in 2020, which you know, uh, wreaked a, a havoc in our lives, in the economy, you know, in the way you know, we uh, appended you know, deep convictions about how the economy works uh, under stress. So that's, that's one thing. Then uh, the war uh, that is raging uh, on the eastern flank of, uh, of uh, Europe as we speak which also caused uh, damage and human lives and so on, and, and probably will also um, uh, uh, make, make damage to, to our economy. Uh, we don't know yet to what extent, but certainly there are signs that the economy is suffering already. Um, the inflation, inflation period, inflation phase, something that we had completely forgotten about. Many of you have never seen inflation. I'm old enough to remember no, the early 80s um, with high inflation still. Uh, but it, it was uh, supposedly a very you know, uh, stuff of the, of the past, the distant past, and it came back. So I mean, the crisis is what has happened uh, since 2018. Now, um, I mean, the, the, the purpose, and let's say the spirit in which I present this story that we put together in this book, 
uh, over the 20 years is, is uh, always the same, that um, history doesn't repeat itself precisely in the same way, but there are no patterns that repeat themselves, and uh, it's, it's good to know those patterns um, not to uh, navigate the, the present and the future a little bit more wisely than we would uh, without knowing not the past. So that's the spirit. And there are some similarities now with the current situation, like uh, uh, Giorgio Na Barbara Navaretti said just, just a minute ago. Okay, so um, now uh, one, one word on uh, how this, this idea of doing the, the book, by the way, it, it came up as a, as a working paper, and then it developed and grew on our, uh, let's say, uh, under our nose uh, in, uh, more and more, and so it became a book eventually. I mean, that, the book was written more or less in six months uh, in the uh, early, let's say, first half of 2019, and, uh, and the, um, the occasion no, that uh, motivated the book was uh, really uh, to be part of the background material that ECB would publish in June 2019, um, ahead of the uh, Sintra conference. Now, the ECB has a flagship uh, conference every year annually, which, is, uh, which used to be held in uh, Sintra, Portugal, very nice location. It has been virtual since, basically since uh, 2020, but uh, this year it will be hybrid, so it will be partly. And at that time, uh, conveniently, the, co the conference was devoted to 20 years of the euro, no? And so that we wanted to do something useful, you know, tapping into our institutional memory and, uh, let's say, putting uh, facts one after the other, lining up events, facts, um, uh, and, uh, yeah, the, the, the way we had lived uh, uh, through them. Uh, so th that was the purpose. Um, the other purpose was, well, when, when facts were not, let's say, more diffuse, were not totally, um, were, were not speaking for themselves, but you know, you have to tease them a little bit and you have to uh, uh, join the dots. Then um, we wanted to, let's say, um, put on the, the hat that we have, the only one, because there is no no historian among us, and are all uh, more or less economists. So we wanted to consult you know, uh, econometrics, and particularly time series econometrics, uh, structural models, and let's say tease out uh, a pattern of what we, we, were, uh, we were describing. And, uh, and the final, I think, uh, purpose was to be also useful for an exercise that was coming up and was already in those days, those months of early 2019, was already looming in our um, future, which was a, a new strategy review. No? And the strategy review, in fact, was launched at the end of 2019, so at beginning 2020, uh, just a couple of months before the pandemic started no, raging. But uh, President Lagarde uh, was, was no advocating and uh, really, um, championing this, uh, this uh, let's say, uh, introspection uh, exercise that central banks sometimes do, not too frequently. Uh, no, it's not that something that you can do any uh, now and then, so it, it has to be uh, infrequent, but they, they have to do it. And we had already our side no laid on this, uh, on this event coming, and we wanted to be also useful for that one. Now, um, the story is more or less that I'm going to tell uh, very, very non-selectively, very, uh, uh, hopefully very uh, concisely, is, uh, is the, in these three chapters, strategy in action, the second regime, and uh, combined armed strategy. So that's, that's the, the story. And the story is pretty, is pretty simple in, in the, at the end, a very simple story that can uh, be summarized in these few lines. And I could stop here, by the way. Um, so basically what the, the core uh, contention of this book is that um, there are the, 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 the history of the ECB can be divided, and at that time it's 20, 20 years now, it's a little bit longer than 20 years, could be divided in two halves, more or less halves, and two regimes. Uh, what is a regime, first of all? No, a regime is, a, let's say, a combination, a mixture 
a makeup of shocks that from time to time, um, a combination, you know, uh, distribution of shocks that from time to time determine and drive the, the, the business cycle and inflation developments. You know, for a central bank, inflation is very important. And so um, sometimes inflation is determined by demand, sometimes some other time is, is more uh, supply, supply side. And our contention is the following, that in the first decades of uh, the monetary union, stretching between, say, 99 to 2011, uh, 2012, so a little bit more than half, it was mainly supply-side inflationary. So uh, there were forces on the supply, and then I'll come back to, the, to those forces in a minute, that were you know, pushing inflation uh, up systematically. It was a, uh, let's say, comparatively inflationary uh, period. And of course, inflation was never very, very high. No? Now we see how inflation can be uh, really you know, disturbing and hurting and painful for, for households, for firms. At the time, it was less. No? But I will, I will show to you, it was a, an inflation, a relatively inflationary period. Then, uh, second half, uh, but uh, let, let, me, let, me, let me come to the second half and the second regime in a minute. Now, the ECB in 1999 had um, defined its objective as something uh, that had to be below 2%. I will also not be more specific about the, the objective, the definition of the objective that the governing council of the ECB came up with in a, at, at the very start, at the very onset of monetary, monetary union in 1998, even, even before not taking over. Um, so uh, they defined what inflation, what price stability, and, and the ECB was you know, assigned to pursuing price stability. This is a treaty of the European Union that says the ECB shall pursue price stability, full stop. That's all the, 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 the treaty has to say about the ECB. So the governing council had to now come in and be more specific, more quantitative. He said, okay, um, the inflation is uh, consistent with price stability if it is below 2%. That, that is what they said in 21. And having decided so that the, the only emphatically, let's say, mentioned uh, number that came up in this, in this uh, 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 communication was 2%, but it was not a target. It was not a central target. It was a ceiling. A ceiling. So anything above was bad, was outside price stability. Anything below was equally no, consistent with uh, price stability. And we see that there is a problem with that. There was a problem in that, in that definition. So, but having defined that, uh, the threshold was in, in fact expedient, uh, exposed, because those were inflationary years. And so anytime inflation was pushed by supply side shocks uh, to, to, no, um, to test this 2%, uh, people kn knew that uh, uh, the ECB was not happy about it. So it would uh, forcefully you know, try to bring inflation back to uh, this uh, price stability area below 2%. So when, inflation, uh, infl when expectations coordinate on, that, on those beliefs, then uh, that becomes uh, a self-equilibrating me mechanism so that inflation is never going to, let's say, become entrenched. No? You, it, you might have uh, bouts or flare-ups of inflation above 2%, but then they, they come back again. Uh, inflation comes back again because in inflation expectations never catch, catches up okay, with inflation realization. So that was expedient. Problem is that that was not the, uh, the end of the story. Then uh, another regime came along, which is the second regime. The first was a supply side inflationary. The second was demand side deflationary or disinflationary. I mean, deflation, we experienced bouts of deflation, but it was rare. Mainly it was disinflation. So inflation being too low, too low. No? And uh, in, in those years, and that was no, um, the watershed, so the, you know, the dividing line between these, these two regimes is more or less the debt crisis. That hit the euro area around 2011, but no, with a, with a follow through um, which lasted uh, longer. And um, uh, in, in those conditions, this, uh, this, the, no, this barrier, no, this reflect, like, like engineers would say, a reflecting barrier of 2% became slack, became 
No, it didn't work anymore as, as it had been working in the, in, the, in the earlier years because inflation was testing no, the lower part of the price stability area. And, uh, and so the ECB um, had to um, no, come up with, uh, with some, some way, some instruments, instruments by the conventional instruments of monetary policy. You know, the central bank conventionally was uh, uh, hiking or, or cutting short-term interest rates. In those years, uh, the, the, there was no room to, to uh, uh, no, no space uh, anymore to cut the short-term interest rate because it was already at zero in 2011, 2012. And so there was no room anymore to resist or to fight, to battle this inflation, uh, the ECB had to invent uh, new instruments, and it came up with these portfolio instruments that, uh, one way or another, were very, very courageous no, in, the, in the time, so it was, was very aggressive, the ECB using. When we say NIRP, FG, APP, TLTRO, these are, are acronyms for, for instruments. NIRP is the negative interest rate policy. By the way, to this very day, we have a negative interest rate policy in place. Uh, forward guidance, FG, is also uh, not giving uh, information on where the, the monetary policy is heading uh, in the future, is, uh, is also very important in uh, no, shaping financial conditions. APP is the asset purchase program, a massive, large-scale uh, purchase program where the ECB has been purchasing bonds uh, issued by the various countries, but also issues by, issued by uh, uh, private institutions. And the TLTRO is a massive lending operation that where we lend, it's still ongoing, we lend to banks at negative rates. So we pay banks for borrowing money from us but on conditions that they lend on the money. So they, they cannot sit on this uh, liquidity that they borrow from us. They have to lend them, uh, let it on, lend it on, okay? To firms in particular. So this is also part of the book and it occupies, you know, the, the, let's say, a little bit of quantitative analysis on this, uh, of this instrument occupies the last part of, of the book. Now, um, very briefly, let me, let me say, uh, I said that already. So the primary objective of the ESCB, the, the European system of central banks, shall be maintained price stability. That's all the, go the treaty has to say about uh, the, the ECB. What the governing council said, a little bit to beef up this definition, is what you read on the top right. Now, price stability shall be defined as a year-on-year -year increase in this index that we monitor for inflation of below 2%, positive rates, but below 2%. This is a gray area that you see in the, in the picture on, on the left. Now, the problem with that is, is a very ample uh, interval. No? So it's, um, uh, it didn't say we prefer the, this or that inflation rate within, within that interval, but it's a quite uh, wide. So if 1% or 0.5% is equally desirable as, say, 1.8%, then you, 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 you see that monetary policy or the policy making uh, body, which is the governing council, a little bit lacked an anchor. No? Because how can you discriminate if inflation goes to 0.5, is that desirable? Um, if it goes 1.8, is that desirable? So you know, it's, um, it's a little bit vague, this, uh, this definition. That was the problem. And that was criticized. The ECB was pretty much criticized in those days. Um, and so it decided under the, let's say, um, guide and, uh, um, let's say, leadership of uh, Otmar Ising, who was the uh, chief economist of the time, uh, the, the ECB embarked on a, on a first strategy review in 20, uh, well, uh, 2003. And you see what they said at the end of this very, of that very long, uh, well, it was not longer, uh, I, I guess. It was six months, seven months, but it was a very intense exercise. They said, well, they did two things. First, they uh, reconfirmed what they had said in 98. So price stability uh, everywhere and um, in, all, um, in all conditions is defined by something that is below 2%. So that was a, a, a proposition about a state of nature. It was not a target, it was a state of nature. When inflation is below 2%, you are in price stability everywhere and always. That they kept, 
But then they say, within this, uh, this range, which was, again, very wide, we, in fact, we don't consider all inflation uh, rates equally desire, desirable. We aim, we aim within this interval for inflation rates that are not too far from 2%, below, but not too far. So this is what they said in 2003, which was the definition of the objective that, um, let's say, had a long life, and uh, it was repealed de facto uh, last July, no? when the ECB did the, the, the second strategy review. Uh, again, very long, uh, at some point interrupted by the pandemic, then resumed, a very long exercise, very you know, painful some in, in, some, in some way, a lot of work. But um, they came up with a, with a different definition. But this definition lasted between 2003 and 2021. Okay, so very good because uh, at least uh, policy had some anchor. No, so you say, okay, we should shoot for rates that are not too low, not too close to zero. They added the space away from zero. No, so uh, having this dot that you see on the left identified within the, the range was, uh, let's say, a steering policy. So it was uh, uh, helping. Uh, to steer monetary policy, no? because if you see inflation uh, going higher, then you know that you have tight, to tighten. If you see inflation that goes lower than this no, uh, dot, uh, then you, you, need, you need to loosen policy. So that was good. It added this uh, safety margin. But there was a problem with that definition uh, as well. Because if you identify you know, uh, a name for policy, a focal point for policy, an inflation rate that is right at the upper edge of this uh, area, and you don't repeal the area, so you, you still say the area 0 to 2% is price stability, then you incur in an asymmetry problem. Asymmetry problem. So you induce, a, uh, um, so you create a system that is inherently uh, asymmetric. And asymmetry, asymmetry, so absence of symmetry, is bad for monetary policy. It's always bad for monetary policy. You, you need to be symm symmetric. Why is that? Because if you imagine everybody believes in this dot, in this aim, and, and so you, you, uh, if that is the case, everybody believes in that, you should expect inflation realizations over year over uh, over year to uh, distribute uh, according, say, uh, to a bell-shaped distribution, a normal distribution that is centered around this dot, as two no uh, tails. But you see what happens that almost half of the time you are outside no price stability definition, yeah, just because the the the, the no, the central tendency is right at the upper edge, which means that this has uh, inherently the potential of focusing the attention of the policymakers more on upside deviation of inflation. So the, uh, when inflation is higher than the dot, then when it is lower than the dot, because when you are higher than the dot, you are very likely to be outside the price stability zone and comfort zone. When you are below the, the dot, even if you are very low, if you, for, for, you, are, you are still within and consistent with, uh, with your mandate of price stability, okay? So that, again, uh, good, good exercise. It added a safety margin away from zero, but it added another problem, it, no, uh, an extra problem, asymmetry, which is, again, very bad. By the way, you see the history of inflation again until only 2018, uh, and you see that in the early years, and this is, you, you see why, in the early years, say until the crisis, until the um, Lehman crisis, there was a tendency of inflation to be above 2%, not below 2%, you see? Why was that? Because, uh, because of this uh, gray or whatever it is, no, it's a brown uh, dotted line which is a, a commodity inflation. So this is an energy, in fact, energy inflation. So even in those years, uh, we, had, we faced a problem that is quite akin to, to what we see now, except that it was um, no, of a lower scale, was much smaller scale. Now it's, uh, it's uh, no, uh, 
an order of magnitude bigger, <laughs> what we see. So that uh, those were years when uh, China you know, was propelled, uh, was propelling itself to the forefront of the uh, global, say, economic arena. It became a superpower, economic superpower. He was very angry uh, of, uh, of commodities, so it was you know, absorbing, devouring commodities, and that pushed up the price of commodities, energy in particular. India as well, but particularly China. Yeah, so that, that was a constant pressure on commodity prices and a constant, let's say, cost push for, for an economy like the euro area, which is transformative. So the, the euro area imports, you know, um, uh, raw material, particularly energy, as we know now, we, we, we are all very well aware of that problem. We import our energy uh, needs. And, uh, and so if there is a constant push, cost push, uh, on that side, that rolls down as a likelihood of rolling down uh, in the, in the, uh, to, to the downstream you know, stages of the, the pricing chain and reaches you know, the consumer price inflation. So that, 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 that was the problem. But again, having defined this uh, very sharp 2% line, that helped because you see that the blue line never goes back, go, goes very, very above, very much above this 2% per, two line. No? It never, so it stays more or less there. And, uh, and these overruns are never very big and never very, very lasting. No? They are, they are short-lived. No? They, they have a tendency of correcting themselves. And this is why, this is why, and this is because uh, inflation expectations were internalized in the fact that there was this sharp line for the ECB, this red line at 2%, and ECB would resist, would try to you know, fight back if it saw inflation ever go, uh, going above 2%. But if you allow for sufficient time in that process, you, you see that core inflation, so core inflation is that part of inflation that is calculated on all goods and services in the basket except food and energy. No, you, you strip out food and energy and you recalculate inflation and you, call, and you find core inflation, what we call core inflation. In fact, we call inflation eggs, uh, food and energy. But it's, it's also called core inflation. That core inflation, if you want to maintain uh, overall inflation, including food and energy inflation, at around 2%, that means with, with, with those uh, no shocks and no repeated shocks of energy and to food and energy, by the way, food also was, was increasing very much because the Chinese had no, started to consume also food. Um, if you want to keep uh, inflation, overall inflation, more or less at 2%, it means that core inflation quite mechanically has to make space, not to, 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 go, to go down. And this is what you see here in the, um, in the green a green area. So the green area, well, the dotted blue is the core inflation, as I said before. The green area is a, is a range of other measures of underlying inflation. So measures that, you know, strip things uh, that do, do, uh, do, let's say, calculate, um, uh, say, a central tendency in the process generating inflation that, um, that exerts, you no know, a pull on inflation in, uh, over time. And you see that you can recognize that that thing was, was declining year over year with uh, more or less two, let's say, discrete uh, jumps down. And, uh, and what, happens, uh, what happens is that this whole distribution that was supposed to be there, right, right now centered on something uh, uh, close to the 2% line, uh, over time, you know, uh, migrates downward. No, migrates downward and uh, becomes centered around not something close to 2%, but something more close to 1%. And that was exactly what happened at the end of the debt crisis, or at, even at the beginning of the uh, debt crisis. Inflation was already very feeble, very, you know, very weak, the inflation process, because of this thing. Now we go uh, through some econometrics, so we um, test whether uh, the data, no, if you no, um, try to squeeze uh, something out of the, of the data, um, no, kicking and screaming, the data uh, uh, support this two-regime story. In fact, they do. 
uh, we have, or we, we think they do, uh, we employ some uh, single equation, uh, system of equation, econometrics, uh, that allow for you know, uh, regime switching. Um, and indeed, uh, we come up with this thing, thing that I now try to summarize here. So in the first regime is a high inflation regime, high interest rates. Um, there is a, 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 an upside uh, supply side uh, impulse coming from outside, no? from uh, the uh, energy, energy prices. Um, the two percent line becomes binding. The ECB says, "Oh, uh, inflation is is no going or has a tendency to go past this two percent." Everybody knows that, notices that, and he, in, they starting uh, thinking ECB will re uh, respond very much. So inflation expectation never never budge. So the inflation expectation more or less remains stable, you no, know, despite these you no know, flare ups in inflation. But core inflation, no, with the with the lag, um, reacts negatively. So if there is a shock, after a while, core inflation declines. Okay. Second regime is not anymore um, a supply side um, uh, inflationary shock. It's a demand side deflationary shock. Now the two percent line is not binding anymore because inflation is very low. What is also very low is the interest rate, because when inflation is low, no, the, the monetary authorities bring in, uh, interest rate to their effective lower bound. At the time, it was supposed to be zero, the effective lower bound. Now we know it's, it's, a, it's a little bit lower, because we have no, a cut the interest rates to below zero, so in the below zero area. But at the time, it was supposed to be zero. So uh, agents say, well, what, what is going? Uh, what, what, what is the ECB going to do? No, it, it can't do anything anymore in the way of resisting this, this inflation. So inflation expectations now start reacting in the wrong way, and they become again an amplifier no, of uh, this inflationary force. So this is the story basically that we have. Now by 2014, uh, things were pretty bad in terms of inflation. You see here. No matter how you measure the inflation, you know, if you took an average, a historical average of past inflation, uh, I don't know, GDP defined inflation instead of consumer uh, index, uh, you, you took uh, various definitions at various horizons of inflation expectations, and you put those you know, uh, orange uh, dots on this chart and comparing it with the, the, the bulk of the, the, the distribution of that measure, over the uh, history of monetary union, you saw that inflation was going off the map. No, it was a uh, uh, way you not know, too low uh, by many measures, and this is wh what triggered you know, this um, uh, this new uh, strategy of uh, of uh, unconventional monetary policies that you see there, and I already mentioned. Now uh, I think I'm. Uh, is it is it um, still within time? Let me say one word uh, on uh, just on, and that, and then I will I will finish. This is what we uh, we find in terms of impacts of these uh, three measures. No, we we don't see uh, we don't uh, include in this picture TLTRO in particular, but these three measures: so negative rates, forward guidance. So when you say what you are going to do in the in the next for over the next few few quarters, and asset purchases and how they impacted uh, year over year on the uh, term structure of interest rate, on the yield curve, what is called the yield curve. Yield curve is, let's say, the um, interest, uh, the, the, it's, it's a curve that, that shows you uh, the level of interest rate per maturity. So, of course, it's, it's always, al almost always uh, upward bending, no? because if you lend and longer maturities, then probably you, you, you want a higher interest rate than if you lend a shorter maturity. It's not always uh, the case, but most of the time. And here we, we show what uh, these three measures did to the two-year, five-year, and 10-year yield uh, over, over those years that you, are, uh, that you see there. Two observations. One, the negative rate policy was very effective. So you see this green, it seems small, these green bars, 
So, but, but it's, in fact, it's a lot, it's a lot, because when you cut uh, interest rates, it, when they are positive, no? you, you bring down interest rate from a positive value to a, a less positive value, but still positive, um, that has very little impact on long-term rates, very little. So it's, it has an impact on, on rates, but only in the short, over the short segment, uh, front end of the, of the yield curve not so much uh, on the 10-year, five-year, 10-year. Whereas here, uh, when we cut, or when the governing council cut interest rates to more and more negative levels, uh, five times they cut by the baby steps, 10, 10 basis points per time, and now it's minus 50 basis points, uh, the, uh, the reaction of long-term rates to, that, to those cuts, although the cuts were very, very small, was disproportionate. So that was something that we learned because nobody knew. There was no, no, uh, no past history of negative rate policy before we, we, we went in that direction. So it was very new and uh, we learned by doing. So that, that is powerful. A and then you see, I mean, the lion's share of the impact on financial conditions on, 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 on long-term interest rates came from the bond purchases, no? when the ECB purchased um, month after month uh, billions of um, worth of, um, of bonds. Um, yeah, and that had uh, also impacts on the, on the economy. So that, that is the next step we take in the, in the, in the model. We, we put those, those impacts into a, a BVARS as, as a Bayesian uh, vector autoregressive model and we simulate what would have happened if the ECB had not uh, gone in that direction. And we, from, from the, that, we infer the impact of the near follow guidance and QE or APP on, uh, on uh, real variables, which is what uh, the ECB and everybody cares about. And let me stop here. Thank you. Well, come on. Uh, Many thanks to Massimo Rostagno, and if you think that this is far away from the ground on which you're working, you're wrong. Because it would be a perfect exercise if you take the slide in which he's been showing the curve of inflation in, in the period of time which goes from uh, uh, the launch of the single currency and, and, and the latest uh, a, a picture that had been taken, which is 2019, and you've seen the curve. It will be a perfect exercise for you, and I did it mentally, and it was fun, to see why the curve was changing. It would be great to, for you to analyze what does it mean in your lives and the lives of your parents and your friends from the past 10 years and see what comes after that. But I'm sure that th this view has been raising uh, uh, ideas uh, uh, um, stimulations and maybe doubts in us all. So uh, I'm, I'm quite tempted to the, I'm, I'm actually, I will do it, to give the floor to Giovanna Nicodano to see uh, what, what do you make of this 40 minutes of uh, inflation, expectations and inflation, which sounds very much like a Die straight song, but mm, no inflation expectations or <laughs> inflation expectations. I'm just kidding. So what do you make of it? Thank you, Massimo. And uh, thank you all for being here and also for those uh, connected uh, via Zoom. Uh, now, if you read the, the book, um, you see that it is not a dry account of what happened. Massimo before used a word, introspection. It is actually a mix of uh, introspection, what we did, why we did it, which, why were we criticized. So it was really another word that Massimo used, learning by doing. Because essentially, central banks uh, had not been used uh, for like a long, long time to crisis. And suddenly they have uh, to face uh, is either excessive inflation relative to the, tar to the objective or too low inflation. And uh, as you know from what we discussed uh, for two months, uh, 
the, the risk of deflation is terrible because it leads to deflation, deflationary expectation, a spiral, deflation spiral, bankruptcies, unemployment, a very bad movie. You want to avoid. But at some point, you have, uh, you cannot just decrease the interest rates because there is this zero lower bound. So the world is asymmetric. You cannot do it. So this long introspection, this long uh, reflection of what, uh, of what had, had happened in the first 20 years of the young European Central Bank lead us uh, to this strategy review and uh, to a change in the, uh, in the objective, uh, uh, in the definition of price stability. What is price stability now? Maybe I state it uh, not enough uh, tightly, but uh, I say a level of 2% in the medium term, okay? So you would like the bell shape that Massimo was uh, showing to you to be centered uh, around uh, the 2% level so that uh, you, you do not have this risk uh, of deflation uh, uh, biting always. So now uh, I'm asking, what is the medium term? Okay, how long is the medium term? And uh, I think uh, that the question is especially relevant uh, to the current situation if I can see the next slide, because I want to quote from the strategy review, essentially what the central bank is saying, well, it allows us some flexibility in fighting the different tendencies. The medium term orientation of the ECB's monetary policy strategy takes account of situations in which inflation on the one side and economic activity and employment on the other side temporarily move in different directions owing to supply side disturbances. Now, these days, uh, it's not only <laughs> it's like from energy, but even before during the COVID crisis, we had uh, all sorts of shocks, both demand and supply shocks with uh, uh, supply chains uh, being disrupted, etc. So we are in this situation where we have this inflation, which is high by historic standard, but uh, we have just uh, come out with generous fiscal policies uh, from uh, the risk of an unemployment trap. So it's a very delicate situation. And at the time uh, before everything, the war shock uh, was hitting, the central bank was saying, in the presence of an adverse supply shock, the governing council may decide to lengthen the horizon under which inflation returns to the target level in order to avoid the pronounced falls in economic activity and employment. So if I can go to the next slide, the question is how long is the medium term? Now, Massimo told us also that uh, in the face of this deflationary threat uh, and the, the difficulty in uh, implementing additional interest rates cut, uh, where interest rates is the normal tool uh, for monetary policy, central banks uh, in general and uh, the ECB in particular invented these new tools that are among which uh, are the purchases of securities, be it public sector or private sector securities. And we saw how effective they were in avoiding the bad outcomes. Uh, and the, the two reasons is uh, to counter the deflationary bias and also because central banks uh, care about uh, financial stability. So when you have a COVID shock hitting March 2020, the only thing you can think about is helping counter that shock. So if you can go further. But uh, like we know that uh, the, for many decades now, central banks are being considered as the lender of last resort to banks, okay? 
when uh, there is a problem, we know that the backstop is the central bank. But in exchange for that function, banks are tightly regulated, especially so after Basel II and Basel III. Now, my impression is that markets are far less regulated, okay? So, why are banks regulated? To avoid moral hazard, because uh, as we discussed uh, uh, for two months, uh, if uh, banks expected uh, bailouts every time they fail, then uh, they would be tempted to take on more, too much risk. So, is there something like this happening in financial markets? And uh, should uh, central banks be considered as market makers of last resort? So I'm asking this because I'm seeing economists uh, starting to use this term, market making of last resort. So it would be very interesting to, to listen to. I stop here, I have another question, but I don't want to steal the questions from the floor and from the connected people, so. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, and we'll see if we will have time later, and I hope so. And now I give the floor um, to another distinguished guest, uh, which is Guido Ascari, he is Professor of Economics at the University of Pavia, and is also economic advisor of the, uh, the Dutch Central Bank, which is the Central Bank of the Netherlands. Professor Ascari. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marco. So first of all, uh, for the nice words, and thank you uh, also to the organizer for uh, asking me to uh, discuss uh, this book. It's a very real pleasure to be here, so thanks, uh, Giovanni, and all uh, the organizer. Uh, as, uh, as Marco said, I'm also working for uh, the Dutch Central Bank, which is part of the European system of the Central Bank, so I'm kind of a wide sense uh, colleague of Massimo, and uh, therefore here I should take this hat off, and here my hat is just as a University of Pavia professor, so I I'm feel free to uh, criticize, uh, because that's the role of a discussion, that, uh, what the discussion sh should be. So the usual disclaimer applies, uh, whatever we say, it's not uh, meant to be uh, <coughs> the, uh, the thought of uh, all the uh, of the Dutch uh, Central Bank, uh, but just for myself. So as all the discussion, shall we, I think we should start uh, with praise uh, the work of, uh, of the book. Uh, that's a good rule that I taught when I was a graduate student, uh, that I've been taught, that uh, you should start the discussion with a praise. And actually, is the, in a sense, it's difficult to understate uh, you know, the importance of this book, or rather, the importance of what uh, uh, you know, the SCB has been doing in these 20 years uh, described uh, in the book. Uh, the SCB is going through uh, very difficult times to navigate, especially after the financial crisis. And I think uh, it's not uh, <coughs> an understatement to say that, uh, or an overstatement actually, to say that the SCB saved uh, the euro itself and uh, to some extent, therefore, also the European Union. So uh, it proved to be for probably the most important uh, I think, institution of the uh, um, European Union architecture. And therefore, we need to be thankful to the SCB and to Massimo in particular. There's been a, you know, been a, a lead role in uh, the SCB decision uh, during uh, the financial crisis. So I think we need to, to take that into account on whatever uh, we say uh, today. Regarding, uh, so going back to the book, now I go to the, you know, try to get some food for thought and some uh, criticism uh, quote unquote. Uh, <clears throat> so I think the narrative of the two regime is uh, intuitive and also kind of plausible. You know, the idea that um, there has been a change in the definition of the target and that uh, has been due to the fact that uh, in the first, uh, there would have been a first regime due to uh, negative supply shock or inflationary supply shocks. And in that regime, uh, the definition of the target below 2% worked very well because it out of self-stabilizing uh, properties. But uh, in the second regime, uh, in front of a deflationary demand shock, actually that definition didn't work very well because they induced a uh, deflationary spiral and uh, deflationary uh, inflation expectations. Uh, that, that, uh, that holds good. Uh, what I would do, I would talk about uh, six 
points if I have time, but Marco will tell me if I have to stop, and uh, eventually I will uh, talk about uh, the QA uh, afterwards. So one is about the target, the, uh, the other one is about the effective lower bound, the two pillars, the medium term, and the new toolbox. So these are all the things that uh, extensively uh, Massimo and his, teams, uh, his team um, talk about in the book. And then I, I'm gonna mention two elephants in the room, I think, in the book. One is uh, the international uh, determinants or international dimension of inflation. And uh, as you ask, I'll think about uh, how much inflation is actually controllable by, by a domestic central bank. And then the other one is uh, fiscal policy, which is mentioned at the end of the book, but uh, I think uh, it's difficult to talk about uh, monetary policy inflation without uh, taking um, a stance uh, and a complete analysis of fiscal policy itself. So um, I will try to talk about the book and also to ask what are the lessons that uh, we can learn for today, because obviously a lot of uh, you know, the book and in before the pandemic and uh, lots of things had, had happened by then. Uh, so uh, the pandemic crisis and the war crisis has, 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 uh, has been taught. And also two strategy reviews, one by the Federal Reserve and another one by the ECB itself. Um, so let's think about the target first. Uh, so the narrative is really centered about this definition of the target, the change in the definition of the target from below 2% and below but close and then 2%. And um, the, the book says that uh, in the first regime, this uh, definition of the target works as a, almost a price level targeting regime. Um, I kind of disagree. The price level targeting regime is a, is a, is a rather different regime. I would have liked uh, you know, to have some simulation of this regime in order to compare to make, uh, you know, um, to back up the statement. And also, but not because I'm a fan of a price level targeting regime, or they should, uh, I should think that, uh, that that should be used. But also because uh, you know, taking into account different strategies might have been um, useful for for the simulation. And another uh, policy strategy that has been advocated by many and seems to be quite important today, I think, or in the first regime, which is, as Massimo said, somewhat similar, is the nominal GDP targeting. So, also that uh, kind of uh, of uh, regime, I think, uh, would have been uh, uh, fun to to see how it worked in your simulation. Um, the uh, self-stabilizing so uh, and the uh, role of the um, of the target. Um, so it's all about inflation expectations, as Massimo said. No? It's about the fact that uh, different definition of the target uh, being, brings different inflation expectations and therefore meet different movements in, uh, in core inflation. And that's you know, the main uh, narrative, which is you know, surely important, but maybe uh, it's not the only thing that, uh, that went on. And uh, in particular, the role of inflation expectations obviously are important, it's entire literature, that's what the Keynesian model is about. But uh, a recent literature actually put a lot of d doubts on the rationality of expectations of agents in the economy, both in households and, um, and firms. Uh, you know, that's the literature that follows, uh, you know, the Kobion and Gronichenko main, uh, main work in the JP and others that follows. And in particular, then one has to ask the question, do actually expectations uh, change when you change the definition of the target? Remember, this definition of the target is really kind of insider thing, right? So it's about below 2%, from below 2% to below to close 2%, and then it's 2%. So then you, you ask the question, how much this is actually going to matter for inflation expectations uh, formation of agents in the economy, right? That, uh, that are not uh, probably so close. So there's a paper by Kobion Grondichenko, Knut and Schelle uh, recently on the US uh, that is looking exactly at this. So he's looking at the uh, strategy view of the Federal Reserve, that they change uh, the, uh, the strategy actually in a quite substantive way because they move to what it, we can call the average inflation targeting, which is rather different from what they did before. And therefore, they ask people, they divided the sample into uh, people, and, uh, and into groups. In one group, they gave the information about the, the change in the strategy. In the other group, they didn't. So I quote from the abstract, uh, those hearing news about the announcement do not seem to have understood the announcement. So that's the first thing. And that's what, uh, you know, if I explain to my mother, she probably would not understand it either. Uh, they're not, oh, my father. Um, they're not more likely to correctly identify the Fed's new strategy than others. 
nor are their expectations any different. When we provide randomly selected households with pertinent information about average inflation targeting, which is the new strategy, their expectations still do not change in a different way than when the households are provided with information about the traditional inflation targeting. Even one year after the announcement, U.S. households remain mostly unaware of the change in the strategy and of its implications, right? So, again, this idea that this change in the wording, which is really a slight change in the wording, affects uh, inflation expectations uh, much, it's... Uh, may be doubtful. And there's a recent work by the Dutch Central Bank, by Gabriele Galatti and uh, uh, Martin Varroy in particular, that actually do the same thing on uh, Dutch households data for the ECB strategy review. And they find basically the same, that uh, you know, even the, people, the, the group of people that are informed about the change in the target definition basically didn't change at all their expectation uh, of inflation. There's also an issue about how much this expectation formation of inflation changed the actual behavior of consumption of households, of households and, and, for, and investment of firms, but that's, that's another issue. So I think there, there must be probably, or at least we should consider something else uh, maybe going on and explaining uh, the dynamics of inflation in these years. Uh, so one thing could be, uh, what uh, I think the press uh, think is uh, one big mistake of the SCB, which is the hike uh, uh, just before the Trichet hike, just before the Great Financial Crisis. Another thing could be the fact that with respect to the Fed, for example, the European Central Bank has been very late on boarding on a QE and other unconventional tools. And that's mainly for institutional reasons, right? So mainly for uh, political uh, problems uh, and legal problems. Uh, due to the international, due to the institutional structure of the SCB, and therefore to the so-called concept of uh, proportionality of SCB uh, measure. Uh, there are uh, s okay some other thing that uh, probably I have to skip uh, given the time constraint. Um, then uh, let me talk about the ZLB and the LB. There, there, there's a lot of talk in the book about the effective lower bound which is obviously very important. Um, and again, uh, drawing from uh, the literature, um, I felt that uh, you know, the simulation in the book, uh, Massimo, my understanding is that the models do not have a ZLB in, this, in the estimation or simulation. Now, models with ZLB or ALB, uh, effective lower bound, zero lower bound, are very difficult uh, to estimate uh, for reason because it's nonlinear, blah, blah, blah. But you know, if you make that, that point, I think you know, I should try to, at least in simulation, try to use uh, models with, uh, with, uh, with ZLB. Actually, uh, there's a recent paper in the JME uh, by myself, uh, a colleague of mine at uh, Oxford University, uh, in which we show that the problem is even worse because um, uh, with the ZLB, generally, there's no rational expectation um, equilibrium at all. So that's just... Uh, just uh, as an aside, but uh, for, uh, for and, and some of the, so I don't want to go into the details, some of the results, especially the results in the shock decomposition, I have some problems to, uh, to understand them or to square them uh, with my a priori at least, and that I think it might be due to some sort of misspecification because of, uh, of the fact that the nominal interest rate was very far in the data from the steady state of the model. Uh, in the second uh, in the second period, uh, let me just talk about the two pillar strategy. Um, in the book, there is a defense of the two pillar strategy. It's actually very interesting because um, it 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 it, it explains how it developed. Right. So obviously, we know that this is a legacy of the Bundesbank, uh, and it's been abandoned after the first uh, strategy review. But actually, I think uh, the defense can be even stronger, Massimo, in the book. And the reason is because, uh, in a way, we can think that the new strategy actually bring back the monetary pillar, right? So I am old enough, as <laughs> some people said here, to remember the, uh, the bulletin of, 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 of the SCB, and there was this uh, monetary pillar, and they were looking at monetary aggregates at the beginning. Then, uh, with time, they were looking less and less at the development of monetary aggregates, because monetary aggregates, uh, as you know, has abandoned us, as a famous quote. Uh. But um, at the same time, they were looking more and more at the so-called counterpart. And the counterpart was credit. 
That's what it was, credit and banks. And now, you know, that's exactly the second pillar of the, sec of the strategy review in a sense, right? So that's uh, the strategy review, the last strategy review is saying that the economic analysis should be complemented by, uh, by a, um, a financial analysis uh, that brings together analysis of uh, macrofinancial uh, linkages uh, with uh, concern about the stability of the financial system and uh, in particular credit, bank lending, uh, risk taking, there's a new bank lending service survey and all such that. And that looks to me like what uh, it should be, uh, we can call it financial stability pillar, but it's, it's somewhat a revenge of, uh, of, of the old uh, uh, monetary uh, pillar. I will not talk about the medium term because uh, Joanna already said about that. So do we have uh, still three minutes? No? Okay, so let me just have one minute then. Uh, <laughs> Uh, one question that I think uh, I would like uh, Massimo, I don't know how much he can answer that, is, the, um, is actually how you're going to play with the new expanded uh, toolbox from now on. So this is a matter of sequencing, it's a matter of fragmentation. Uh, the ACB has said a lot of, uh, lot of times that it's not going to end uh, it's going to first end, uh, you know, the net asset purchases, then increase the rates, and then eventually think about uh, tapering uh, the stock of um, of, uh, of, um, of of assets, uh, the so-called QT or quantitative tightening. So, how do you think you're going to play with these two instruments now that you have both of them? And the economy seems to be in a very different situation than in the second regime, right? But it seems to be more in the first regime. Shall we go back? to inflation targeting as defined in the first regime that worked very well uh, according to your uh, narrative, no? the below 2% because of the self-stabilizing role in a situation like today of inflationary uh, supply shocks. And let me stop here and if I have time I will talk about the international dimension of inflation. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much, Guido. Uh, I don't know where it is my nostalgia for, for the Benelux, but I also sent, sensed a very, a very light Dutch accent in your English, <laughs> which is true. And, 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 and I heard some frugal assessment as well. So, I mean, uh, tonight we're going Dutch. But now, we still got half an hour to go, and we have so many questions which have been raised by Professor Nicodano and Professor Ascari. Uh, how long is the medium term uh, and, and, and the financial market and the risk of moral hazard, uh, the, 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 the delayed resource interventions and then the new toll box and the relation between expectations and targets. Now, um, Massimo Rostagno, do you think you can deal with them in, in, in no. 10... You can say yes or no and uh, deal with them in 10 minutes, because then uh, I would be really happy to open the floor to the students. No, th thank you, uh, first of all, Joanna and, um, and Guido, no, for, for taking time <laughs> to go through this book, this tome, which is not, let's say, a bad side, uh, say, reading. <laughs> no. um, so that's, that's the first thing. If I could go back to my slides, maybe um, I have some slides in the in the background that are prob probably can. That's I typical of the ECB. You <laughs> already got the answers in the previous slides. We, we always we, do that. Yeah, we span all scenarios, so you know. And uh, can we go back to the slides? Ah. Uh, anyway, no. Uh, on uh, on the medium term, that's an important an important question. In, in fact, no. The medium term was okay. Thank you. Uh, the medium term was, um, le le let me make uh, one, um, one remark, w was always a mainstay of the strategy, even from the very, very beginning. So it uh, made its way into official communication already in this press release of 98. You now what they say, price stability is da 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 da, and that has to be delivered in the medium term. So they, they always recognize the fact um, that uh, no, uh, the, the, the control that central banks have on inflation, on the process, uh, data generating process for inflation, is that doesn't mean that um, central bank can control inflation t today or tomorrow. And by the way, what Christine Lagarde said uh, two days ago, three days ago in, uh, in Washington, um, 
if I'm if I'm raise, raising rates now, I'm not gonna you know uh, control energy prices or the bottlenecks. So this is outside the scope of monetary policy. So monetary policy does b uh, best when it looks into you no know, uh, horizon at the end of a horizon over which it can you no know, legitimately and uh, realistically think it can control inflation. And that's, let's say, two or three years. Um, now, there is a, uh, so, so that was always, no, um, it was not totally in the strategy statement of 1998. It has now been officially no, promoted to the, the constitutional uh, script of the ECB in uh, July 21, but, but it was always there. And there is, in fact, a, an interesting speech by uh, Trichet in um, uh, 2008, I think a few weeks, three weeks, three, four weeks before Lehman. Um, and uh, the ECB was facing the same problem, no? another bout of energy-induced inflationary uh, spike in the euro area. That was the summer of 2008. And uh, he was saying uh, we, we can't do much except one thing, which is to be, remain vigilant. He, he liked this word very much, to be vigilant. Vigilant that what is happening now doesn't infiltrate uh, inflation expectations, which means that it doesn't create the condition for this to not uh, become endemic, this uh, inflation problem to become endemic. At the time, inflation was around 4%, of course, very very high number for the ECB, um, and now it's seven, more than 7%, 7 7.4. Anyway, but, and so that, that was the, already the concept. No? The, uh, what do we say about, um, about the medium term, or what, what, are, what, what are the lessons that, I mean, the, the history of the ECB, um, uh, let's say, can, can be used to no? uh, distill? Uh, well, first of all, even if you are, uh, and again, Lagarde recognized that uh, a few, few days ago, even if you are confronted with a big inflation problem, inflation now is, is, is spiking, don't jump the gun unless, unless you have uh, reasons to believe that if you don't do, uh, if you don't take action, um, again, no, um, the uh, current inflation is going not to uh, translate, to, to influence inflation expectations in the medium term. Because that is what can transform uh, something that could be temporary, and we have all the reasons to believe that what we see now is temporary. Uh, I mean, the, the temporariness of this, uh, of this inflation uh, phase is, uh, is, no, has become longer. Uh, but but certainly it's, it's temporary because it's supply side. No, it's energy related, and it's bottleneck related. No, the fact that there are uh, imbalances in demand and supply due to what happened two years ago, mainly. No, so the, we are in the aftershocks of the still of the pandemic. So the, the economy is finding its way, uh, working off. No, this 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 shock which was pretty pretty big. But if you have reasons to believe that if you don't act, then what is happening today is going to translate into inflation expectation, then you should act. No, you should tighten policy. So what, what, uh, how long is the, the, the medium term cannot be defined? And again, Trichet was saying very, very nicely, if it is a demand shock no, that creates more inflation, then the medium term is short then you have to react as soon as possible. But it cannot be shorter than 18 months because, I mean, the, that's not the horizon that takes or the, 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 the time that it takes for, for monetary policy to have an influence on inflation according to our models that we all use, 18, 24 months. Um, when it is a supply side disturbance, then, then the medium term tends to be longer, no, can be longer. But again, with the proviso, that if you uh, look very far into the future and you say, okay, I think I see through this hump of inflation, so I do no nothing because I, I expect inflation to go back to 2%, um, no sooner rather than later. Um, if there are no risks that by doing nothing, no, you, you, you increase the risk that inflation stays high no, uh, into, the, into the medium term. 
So a little bit this is the, is the notion. Now on the market maker of uh, last resort, um, no, uh, the ECB, so the, the, the intention, so when I say no, I say, the, the, inten <laughs> the intention of the ECB when it intervened in the secondary market uh, for bonds um, was not, not to, uh, to become the market maker of last resort. It did it for stance pur purposes. So it had more or less exhausted you know, the reservoir of monetary policy space uh, no, to, to act conventionally, no, by just cutting the, the policy rate. So that was more or less exhausted. And so it wanted to, no, uh, since inflation uh, remained very, very, uh, very weak, the purpose was not to revive inflation and the economy. The economy was also very anemic. The, the growth rate over 14, 15, 16 was very anemic. So that was the purpose, Stan's purpose. It was not no financial stability. Having said that, and, and in fact, uh, you, you know when, when uh, the, the ECB intervened, it didn't intervene more in Italy, uh, no, purchasing more Italian bonds than, than German bonds. No, the, 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 let's say the uh, uh, stipulation was that it would intervene uh, in all markets of the 19 members uh, according to capital key. So every country that belongs to the Euro area, in fact, even those who do not belong but uh, are part of the European Union, they have a capital key. So they, they have a share of the ECB capital which is proportional to the, the size of the economy and the size of the population of the country. And so the, the, the purchase of Italian bonds was proportional to the, the weight of Italy in the euro area, no? and, and the same for Germany. Now, this is not precisely the case because of technical uh, reasons, but more or less the case. But there, is the, the, there has been um, instances in which uh, the ECB has indeed intervened, not with a stance purpose in mind, but with a financial stability purpose in mind. And the reason is that the ECB, in order to now make sure that it can intervene and can you know, control inflation and can uh, you know, be in charge of monetary policy, it has to make sure that transmission also works, is viable. And in a currency union, transmission has a tendency sometimes to not work you know, and to, let's say, uh, have cracks that you know, run across country, country uh, borders. So, just to make you two examples, one was the debt crisis when you know, Italy and Spain and the, the, the bond, bond yields of Italy and Spain skyrocketed because there was you no know, uh, risk that Italy and Spain, particularly Italy, I would say, would be ejected by the, the that there was you no know, the, the talk in the in the markets would be ejected from the uh, monetary union, so it would not be able to pay back you no. Know, its liabilities in euro, but in you know, uh, new, a new currency. So that was the risk. That was you know, uh, uh, producing uh, a lot of you know, uh, tension and stress in Italian bond markets, and similarly in Spain. So in those cases, the ECB intervened in order to preserve the viability of transmission, so in a targeted way. So purchasing Italy, purchasing Spain, Greece, Portugal, Ireland at the time. There was another in instance, much more recent, which is the PEP, uh, per um, Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program, which is a huge program that was invented uh, in, a, in a couple of days uh, after the pandemic uh, was declared as such, so that was a declared a pandemic, and had already had some, some very bad implications for, uh, for markets, particularly Italy, again, uh, because Italy was hit, you know, as you remember, uh, sooner and uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a bigger way than, than other countries. So this PEP uh, program intervened in all countries, but more on, it, on Italy, more, a little bit more on Spain, and less in France, for example. So there was this you no know, flexibility. Now the, the, the buzzword here is flexibility, and it's a, a very big concept now which is um, uh, no, uh, in, in, the, in the latest uh, couple of um, 
policy statements in, uh, in uh, that in February and that in April. But that, these are two different things and two different modalities of interventions. One is stance and the other one is transmission. But again, in a currency area, as diverse as the, the monetary union is, um, the ECB has to take care of the tra of transmission, no? and uh, that it doesn't know uh, that uh, monetary policy transmits more or less evenly um, across border. Now, on, uh, on Guido, thank you, uh, Guido, many, <laughs> many questions, many tricky questions also. Well, also Giovanna's uh, were, were tricky. <laughs> but um, so on uh, price level targeting, so um, no, it's not a price level targeting. But what we say is, is something different, is that, that probably, so price level targeting was never, is a regime that was never put in place, no? Only once, probably in the 30s, by Sweden. But I mean, who, who, who remembers that? Uh, it was a, a different world, no? Uh, so this is the closest that probably one has ever observed in recent times uh, to, to something like a price level target. And I tell you why. Because at some point, you, you have seen this, uh, well, I can also, you have seen this uh, overruns, you know, inflation in, the, in those early years. At some point, the governing council started becoming very concerned about its own credibility and say, well, we say uh, that price stability is below 2%. And in fact, if you look back, inflation tends to be above 2%, not below 2%. So we are, our credibility is, is, is on the line. No? And, uh, and then wh what you mentioned, Guido, which is the, the famous decision in 2011, but also the other uh, two decisions, by the way, in 2011, they hiked twice, um, and the second times uh, close to uh, something that was already a pretty advanced uh, financial crisis. Um, but they also hiked um, a few months uh, or a couple of months, three months before Lehman, you know, when the Federal Reserve was loosening policy very much, because of that uh, of that concept, because they said we have to prove that if you take an average of inflation, and, uh, and you know that 2009, which was the 10 year of the euro was approaching, and Trichet was very concerned that people would say, oh, uh, looking back and say, well, if I take an average of inflation, I'm sorry, it's not two per below 2%, <laughs> it's above 2%. So in that sense, I think there was a price level targeting, say, um, notion infiltrating a little bit and uh, motivating what they did in 2008 and 2011. On the role of, uh, let's say, communication and uh, expectations, and I mean, I, I totally agree with you. And I, um, I like very much Gronyshenko's uh, uh, papers. Shall I stop? No. Uh, no. no. Not yet? OK. So let me say this thing on uh, Koronyshenko, because I, I like that paper very much. And I truly believe that is exactly right. So that um, people, and when we say people, is households and you know, firms, uh, wider, no? wider uh, economy. Um, basically, they don't listen when we, when we speak. They don't understand when they listen. And they don't agree when they understand. So this, this is the, uh, let's say, the triad or the, the triangle of uh, misery for central banks. Um, but um, nevertheless, uh, there are people who listen and understand and take action. And those are the market traders <laughs> and investors. So they know because they pass through all you know, the commas and full stops of the text that ECB or other central banks publish. No, and uh, and they take decisions. And the journalists also. And the journal. Oh yeah, the journalists as well. Sometimes they don't understand. No? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but also the traders don't understand sometimes. And um, and when they do that, you know, they add a link which is very powerful. For example, in that in those day, in those years. It's true nobody was listening to the ECB and that nobody understood what the below but close to 2% meant and so on. But traders did. And when, and when or traders or observers, or watchers, and you know, this, this community, financial community, did understand, 
And when they, they, they were seeing inflation going above uh, 2%, they said, well, the ECB will, will react, the curve will steepen. And what would happen that then it was uh, an appreciation of the currency. Now, you, you saw a huge appreciation in those years vis-a-vis -vis the dollar. No? The, the euro uh, touched uh, no, 150 with the dollar, which was a pretty high, high exchange rate. And that was disinflationary. So you see, that is the link. That is the link. I, I totally agree. Nobody understands. Nobody listens. But, but those who, who listen, they, they take action. And that's, that's the link. So let, let me stop here. I don't know. On the two pillar, I agree. Credit is, um, is important. Money is less important. But money is also important sometimes. And um, well, <laughs> uh, so money well. is important. Yeah. Mm, two questions from the audience, please. Just, just state your name and be sharp. OK? The first, first hand there, Dai. Uh, yes, we'll go. Oh, you can. Oh, no, you must have a microphone because we, we got a line. Okay, sorry. Be sharp. Yeah, uh, this is Matteo Fatale. Thank you for this event. And I'm the one who emailed you asking for the book. And I'm sorry. So um, thank you for the, um, for the answer to so, Professor Issa Nicodano. The question were my same. So, um, my question is, first of all, we know that 40% uh, of the known supply, known global supply, is from the Ukraine. And given that the known is uh, useful for the lasers, and the lasers are useful for the microchip, we know that the inflation is going to be higher than we expect. Then we know that, for example, on the Shanghai's harbor, the waiting list for the, for the um, is at a um, record level, and then uh, the inflation will be higher again. The, um, the shipping costs uh, will be higher. So I know that now the ECB uh, must, must say what is going to do tomorrow and what is going to do the day after tomorrow in order to drive all the expectations. Is the ECB going to do it or what else? Okay, let, let's see if we have a second question. Yeah. Any, can you repeat? Okay. So, do we have a second question? No, 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 no. Elsa, we, you've been a student. <laughs> we got a hand there. Good evening, my name is Carolina. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, um, after the regulatory tightening uh, following the um, great financial crisis, um, new financial intermediaries like shadow banks and uh, fintechs emerge, having the opportunity to, opportunity to exploit uh, um, competitive advantages. So my question is, uh, do they represent a treat uh, for financial stability and uh, should uh, the government extend uh, the government safety net also to these um, uh, new intermediaries or simply should they be more regulated even if uh, it would imply uh, lower levels of uh, competition in the banking sector? Thank you. On, um, on saying what, what the ECB is, uh, is going to do, I, I think um, the ECB has, been very, has become very no, um, specific, I would say, even, on uh, what it's going to do even, even uh, uh, in, the, in the short term. And this, this is what, what you see now on the screen is, um, is just, um, let's say, a literal quote of the, of the last, uh, last monetary policy statement. Uh, so they say basically a couple of things. One is that um, uh, the uh, the asset purchase program is, um, which is the, the standard APP that I was talking about, is um, yeah um, expected to uh, to be concluded in the third quarter. Uh, that will not be uh, say um, uh, on a on a let's say. Um, on a, on a uh, let's say definitive track, but um, th there is still some optionality. 
The ECB wants to see, as, as you see, the Governing Council wants to see how the data develop, particularly on the war side. Uh, but but that's the the expectation. So that's that's pretty pretty clear what they are saying. Then I say, well, once once we stop purchasing, re remember that in uh, in times of very high inflation, ECB is still purchasing. So it's still, in a way, um, no. Uh, keeping uh, accommodation and stimulus pretty pretty alive. So uh, once we, we stop purchasing, then we will look at interest rates. And interest rate, again, remember they are still negative. So the policy rate is still negative. It's minus 0.5%. Um, and there, is, uh, the, there are three conditions for uh, rate hike that ECB has been spelling out very, very precisely um, already in July last year. So there are three conditions. They need to see inflation going 2% to 2% um, early in the projection horizon um, and remain at 2% uh, thereafter. So they, they need to be very no, uh, certain uh, and reassure that when they see inflation rising to 2%, at the time, because in July inflation was below 2%, now it's higher, but, uh, but that was the condition. We, we want to see inflation to go back to 2% and stay there for the remainder of the projection horizon. We do projections every, every quarter, no? and we project inflation over a two, three years, three year horizon. Th th those were two conditions, and the third condition was an underlying inflation. So the, the stuff I was uh, showing to you before, no, the, the core or underlying measures of inflation, they want to see underlying measure of inflation consistent, so going, measured now, going to levels that can give reassurance that in the medium term inflation will remain at 2%. Because if core and other measures of underlying inflation go back to 2%, that is a good sign that no, the inflation process is strong enough to remain at 2%. So you, you see, it's a pretty, pretty detailed uh, blueprint or <laughs> pretty detailed, say, um, March orders for, for the ECB you not know, to follow in the, in the, next, uh, in the next quarters, uh, uh, including in the face of the, the inflation uh, scenario that we see. The last thing, flexibility. The flexibility is very important. And they say will remain an element. So they they saw that flexibility worked very well. You know, purchasing one country more than the other because that country had a broken transmission was pretty good and pretty effective during the PEP time, <coughs> pandemic time. They want to retain flexibility, and they say if needed. Now it's not needed, but if needed, if a, a transmission breaks breaks up again across country lines. We are, we are going now to act again uh, according to uh, this, uh, this flexibility uh, option that, uh, that we had. Ah, on non-banks, well, non-banks, uh, of course, um, central banks would always say uh, more regulation is better because we would be more relaxed no? um, uh, in, uh, in dealing also with, uh, with non-banks. You know, um, the ECB, um, lends and can lend only uh, to credit institutions, among other reasons, because credit institutions are regulated. And so there is somebody who is looking into them and uh, now seeing, uh, testing that they are sound institutions. When, when they borrow from the ECB, they, they can pay back you know, what they borrow. Uh, and so that, that is one reason why non-banks are, uh, are not uh, included in, the, in our counterparties. Uh, not consider counterparties. If, it, if they were regulated, probably they would be included in, in counterparties, and they would benefit from that because, uh, I mean, banks benefit from uh, you know, being able to borrow from the ECB, probably, uh, including at negative rates now. So it's, it's pretty good, um, let's say, good um, uh, uh, arrangement. Okay, thanks, Massimo. I should close it down, but, but Guido Scari asks for the floor for 60 seconds. Yeah, just a very quick uh, thing that might be useful for students, uh, despite maybe obvious to us, uh, related to the medium term orientation. One reason why a central bank should be forward looking is that the effects of a monetary policy uh, measure it takes time to affect uh, the real economy, right? So you're not 
gonna react to what is happening today, but you need to think about what's going on, and that's why there's a lot of emphasis on what would be inflation at the end of the projection horizon, right? Because that's uh, you know uh, the polar star for the uh, for the decision. Well, but in the name in the name of optionality, gradualism, and flexibility, that's 30 seconds to Alfonso Yozzo, but 30 seconds. Uh, a question: When will uh, you write the next book? Will be monetary policy in times of war? <laughs> <laughs> Time of crisis, and crisis, we have seen what crisis, real crisis is. <laughs> so, thank you. Hope not, it will be after the war, I hope. So uh, I, thank, I thank everybody for joining us, either in streaming and here at Collegio Carlo Alberto. Uh, uh, Professor Nicodamo for setting the stage for us, and Guido Scari for bringing us a little bit of Dutch flavor to our debate, and of course to Massimo Lostagno, who's been our uh, a relevant and important host who has given us the young person's guide to inflation expectations. I thank you very much. Please read La Stampa. We have uh, daily things and we no lies, uh, <laughs> and no misunderstanding. Read La Stampa. Thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, thanks to Professor Barbara Maretti for hosting us and see you soon. Uh, uh, be happy and lucky. Grazie. <laughs> <laughs>